So I believe we discussed the two sort of roles that geosmotic acid plays in responses to herbivory. One is the local response where elicitors, remember those are molecules that are present specifically associated with the, in this case, insects, but it also might be mammals that are eating or pathogens. Those elicitors are signaling molecules that start a sequence of events. So we said that in the case of local responses, it was often compounds that are present in the saliva of the eating insects trigger the production of geosmonic acid that then uh, trigger certain responses in the local cells. But the other thing that this is showing is that those same elicitors in the phloem parenchyma cells can generate a signaling, a lo another local signaling molecule that basically goes just to the neighboring cells, to the, the um, companion cells, that also turns on the synthesis of geosmonic acid. But now that geosmonic acid is specifically um, brought into the phloem so it can be transmitted to the rest of the plant. So this, you, what you want to do from this is to contrast local responses versus systemic responses. Both of them are obviously going to be important in terms of dealing with herbivores or dealing with pathogens. The local response is the pathogen or the herbivore is already there on those leaves. The systemic response says, get ready, these guys are coming. Okay, so in terms of herbivory, yes, sorry. Response or does geosmonic acid itself produce in the Okay, so this, this, yeah, so this is sort of um, really a semantic issue almost, and that is what's, where, what, what part of this do we call signaling, right? So there's signaling that's local. So something must be happening in this phloem parenchyma cell to detect the presence of the elicitor, and in response to that elicitor, secrete this prosystemin. The systemin then creates a local response in the companion cell. Systemin triggers the formation of geosmonic acid. The geosmonic acid then goes by the, the normal pathway into the phloem, and that geosmonic acid must trigger local responses in all the other cells it contacts to trigger the formation of whatever compounds are going to inhibit the herbivory. So, there's, there's obviously a sequence of signaling here, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. The way I like to think of it, and the, certainly the way I'll present it to you, is that signal transduction is a cellular process. But the end of a signal transduction pathway might be produce a molecule like systemin or pr produce a molecule like jasmonic acid that moves to other cells and triggers new signal transduction pathways in those cells, okay? So it's, it, whether you want to call the whole thing a signal transduction pathway or whether you want to call each little part a signal transduction pathway and then having some sort of chemical hormonal transmission, you know, if we think about it in humans, for example, we have lots of ways of doing intercellular signaling, hormones and neurons and things like that. This is basically the same thing. This is intercellular signaling. This is intercellular signaling. But to induce that requires that the cell respond to some particular re signal. Right? So how you want to draw that line is, is really up to you. But I'm going to draw the line that signal transduction happens at the cellular level. And the one cell, the response of one cell might be to release something into the rest of the organism that in other cells triggers signal transduction pathways. Not present in the cell, but if the cell contents get mixed up, does my acid can form in the absence of a known elicitor? No. No. You're thinking of the um, cyanogenic um, glycosides and the glucosinolates. So 
these guys are the ones that are the compound and the enzyme that lops off the sugar is pre are present in separate parts of the cell. When the contents of those get mixed up, the production of these active compounds that, that are toxic to the, to the herbivores are produced. But in the case of jasmonic acid, jasmonic acid is synthesized from linolenic acid in the chloroplast. That's something that's normally there. Presumably, there's something down here associated with this pathway that's specific to the formation of jasmonic acid that's being turned on in the presence of the elicitor. Okay? So does that distinction make sense or not really? It is a response to mechanical wounding, but what is the thing that, what is the thing that elicits the formation of jasmonic acid? Well, that's what I thought the formation occurred after like simple mechanical wounding in the absence of uh, So if you just break the leaf or something like that, it's certainly possible. I'm not aware of that, but it's certainly, anybody know, anybody else know anything about that? It's, it, it's certainly possible that that's the case. We'll talk about some signal transduction pathways that are induced by mechanical damage to leaves. Even movement of leaves can induce signal transduction pathways. So what you're describing is certainly possible. I'm just not aware of it. Obviously, this is not my area of expertise in my physiology. If you find, if you find something that really documents that, let, let me know so we can talk about it. Okay? All right. So the question still is, what are the compounds that are produced either locally in the mesophyll cells or in response to the systemic movement of jasmonic acid that inhibit the, the eating of herbivorous insects or even mammals? And there's really two main classes of these things that are produced, actually three main classes. They're amylase inhibitors. So remember, amylase is starch, and there are compounds that are produced in response to these signaling pathways that inhibit the, the breakdown of amylase. There are also protease inhibitors. Compounds that pre prevent the breakdown of proteins. And there are lectins. These are compounds that, that bind up all sorts of proteins, particularly proteins with carbohydrates associated with them. So the idea behind these is not to you know, taste bad, but to limit the nutritional, cap the nutritional quality of the materials that the, that the insects or the animals are eating. Okay? So it's an interesting question from an evolutionary perspective. If, if the animal eats the leaves but can't get any nutritional quality out of it, is that going to keep the animal from eating the leaves in the future? Well, presumably the answer to that is yes. Otherwise, plants wouldn't be doing this. But it's a little hard to actually understand what's going on there. Yeah, you might, that might be the, the sort of the expected outcome of that. But clearly that can't be the case. Otherwise, this wouldn't work, right? Okay, so let's switch now to talking about uh, defense against pathogens. And when we talk about pathogens, we're talking about things like bacteria and fungi and things like that. And we can really divide pathogens into two basic categories. There's biotrophic pathogens versus necrotrophic. And the difference between these two is biotrophic pathogens don't kill the host. They infect the host, and they remove compounds that they want to keep them alive to allow them to multiply. But they don't kill the host, where obviously necrotrophic ones do. Necrotrophic ones, the outcome is death of the host. Biotrophic ones is 
making the host weaker. So the biotrophic um, pathogens don't necessarily kill the organism, but other things might kill the organism more easily because these biotrophic guys are taking away carbon and nitrogen that the, that the organism needs. Okay, so obviously both of these are, are bad for um, plants and they want to be able to deal with those in some reasonable way. So a num there's a number of different types of mechanisms that are induced in response to the presence of pathogens. Pretty much the general story is the same. That is, there is some sort of elicitor molecule, and that elicitor may be a protein or a compound that is a component of the pathogen. But very interestingly, there's been a number of different types of elicitors that are identified that are the result of the interaction of the pathogen with the plant cell. For example, in order for this pathogen to be able to infect the cell, it's got to either get into the cell or get things into the cell. It means it needs to get, that, get through the cell wall. So many plant pathogens, bacteria and fungi, have cellulases, other enzymes that break down the plant cell wall. The cellulases that break down the plant cell wall from the pathogen are different than the cellulases that are present in the plant. And so the products of those breakdown are different. So the plant has receptors that detect breakdown products that are the result of the pathogen being there and not the result of what the plant might be doing. So there's a number of different type of elicitors that can signal what's going on here. Those elicitors will see, will bind to some sort of receptor, and then bring about a number of different types of responses. One of the main types of responses to pathogens is called the hypersensitive response. Often abbreviated HR. Hypersensitive response is programmed cell death. It's apoptosis. So those cells that are being infected by the pathogen, and typically those cells that are immediately adjacent, go through a pre-programmed sequence of cell death. But in the process of doing that, do a lot of other things. One of the main things that they do is they produce a lot of reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are all obviously not good for any living organism. They're not, not just bad for plant cells. So those reactive oxygen species have a negative effect on the fungi or the bacteria that are trying to, to um, infect the cell. They also turn on the production of uh, phytoalexins and other types of compounds that are involved in trying to combat the presence of the bacteria. Essentially, the idea is kill the cells immediately in this vicinity of the pathogen infection and limit the ability of the pathogen to move further in the plant. So what you end up with is little dead spots in the middle of a leaf, for example, where the pathogen has become isolated. So if this works, the leaf has sacrificed a few cells, but the rest of the plant survives. Okay? So hypersensitive response is a very localized response that limits the ability of the invading organism to get very far into the leaf. Another sort of thing that happens is um, the synthesis of hydrolytic enzymes. So the cell walls of fungi and of bacteria have specific types of compounds in it that one of the things the plant can do to defend itself is to release enzymes that break down the pathogen cell wall, right? So the pathogen cell wall serves a very similar role that the cell wall in plants do. In particular, it has a role in terms of osmotic characteristics. The pathogens can stand to be in lower osmotic strength solutions because they have a, the presence of the cell wall. You break down that cell wall and the pathogens, the cells um, basically explode. Okay, so that the, the ability of the plant to damage the pathogen cell wall is another way of defending itself. Okay, I mentioned 
the production of phytoalexins. Phytoalexins are a group of compounds. They're very diverse. They, they, they're, there's some terpenoids, there's some phenylpropanoids, there's alkaloids that are phytoalexins. But they are compounds that are produced in active response to pathogens. Okay, so they're not present before the pathogen is produced. They're produced specifically in response to the pathogen. And I think we got some examples of phytoalexins from different types of um, organisms, so you can see that they're related to, um, <clears throat> they have the basic structures of a number of different types of compounds that we were talking about before. Remember that secondary products, the types of secondary products are, that are produced follow very distinct phylogenetic patterns. So do you, you'd expect to see similar types of phytoalexins if you look in, for example, all the legumes. Or if you look in a different group of plants, you'd see a different group of phytoalexins. But they all serve the same general function in terms of active response producing compounds that limit the ability of pathogens to grow. Okay, another interesting part of this that you shouldn't be particularly surprising to you is all of these responses are local. We would expect to see the same sort of systemic responses in response to pathogens that we talked about in, in response to herbivores. And this is typically referred, re, referred to it as systemic acquired resistance. Or SAR. So just like the systemic responses that happen in response to herbivory that are dependent upon jasmonic acid, there has to be some sort of whole plant signal that's involved in taking the information from the point where the pathogens are, are attacking to the rest of the plant to signal what's going on here. And the molecule that does that is salicylic acid. So we talked about salicylic acid on Tuesday when we talked about secondary products in uh, the benzoic acid family. Salicylic acid is a derivative of benzoic acid. And as, as some of you pointed out, it's closely related to um, acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. But the production of salicylic acid, the local production of salicylic acid and the transmission of that product to the rest of the plant is the signal to the rest of the plant to turn on processes, obviously not the hypersensitive response, but to turn on the synthesis of phytoalexins and things like that to prepare the rest of the plant for the obviously high likelihood that pathogens are going to attack other cells besides those ones that the pathogen started out at. Interestingly, there's a derivative of salicylic acid, methyl salicylic acid, which is volatile. It can be released into the air by plants. And that methyl salicylic acid is a signal to neighboring plants that the pathogens are coming. So that the production of methyl salicylic acid in one plant in response to pathogens can signal neighboring plants that the same thing is happening. So, it's a good question. So this plant is presumably investing some carbon, let's say, in production of a compound that, in the first approximation, you might say doesn't do this plant any good. So what, what might be a benefit of this? Well, usually plants are in populations. Yeah. So if you have one that has this, you can do that for whatever. Um, you'll use more seed. Um, yeah, you're heading in the right direction, but I think you're missing the sort of the one key important thing, right? So, if this plant lives in a population of, of similar plants, what's the benefit of giving up carbon to tell the neighboring plants that pathogens are coming? 
What's the benefit of making and helping a neighboring plant survive? That species could go on. Why? How? It's like altruism. Yeah, but all those things are correct, but you're missing the key link. What's the role that this plant may play in the, the reproduction, pollination, right? Right. So if plants are obligate outcrossers, if they're not self-pollinators, then the pollen's got to come from another plant. Right? So survival of the other plant might be very beneficial in this circumstance. That's, this may not be the only explanation, but it's certainly one possible explanation that helps you figure this out. You would also think, though, it might be a bad thing because the plants are also in that close vicinity competing for nutrients, too. So, but, but it's, but it's, No, I mean, you're raising you're a completely valid point. I mean, the, the take-home message from a question like that is, there's a lot of things, both positive and negative, that really need to be taken into account. And we can't really assess that in any reasonable way, other than to say, the plants do it. If the plant does it, it has to be, it's almost certainly an overall benefit for the plant. Right? Jenna? Um, do all plants do this? Good question. Because, like, I wonder if there's a difference. I wonder if somebody has looked into it and maybe like, maybe only outcrossers do it. Or like maybe, you know, self-pollinated self -pollinated plants might not do it. Or maybe plants that, big, that live in like big populations, say like, I don't know, like small grasses, mm -hmm. that like live all together and do it more than like, a, it's a good tree question. That a tree would, yeah. Because they, I mean, they it's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. But there's one other possibility that we're overlooking. There's an argument that's made that part of the role of methyl salicylate is within plant communication. Yep. It's more rapid response. That's right. Like right. so, it might be that this has nothing to do with signaling neighbors, and it evolved for signaling self. That transfer of volatiles through the air within a plant it's going to be a lot faster than transfer of, of salicylic acid in, in the, the xylem or the phloem, right? So that may very well be the reason for this. And the secondary effect is that it helps neighboring plants. Yeah? I mean, you could also, like, you know, this time this plant is not another plant, but another time, you know, his neighbor might be the one that's infected. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also an example of an animal with like bioluminescence, like very effective. Right. So there's, I mean, the whole idea of altruism is a very complicated thing from an evolutionary perspective. You know? So the bird among a flock of birds who makes noise to warn the flock of birds that there's a predator coming is immediately announcing its location to the predator. Why do they do that? I mean, obviously, breeding sorts of things play an important role in that, and potentially could play a role in this as well. But it's complicated. You're asking good questions for which there aren't necessarily definitive answers. Are there plants that don't do this? I don't know. That's a good. Uh, my guess is this is not uniform among all plants, but I don't know that for sure. Anybody? Plant pathologists? Okay, so let's move on then. Are we, we okay with this? So I want to move on to talk more specifically about signal transduction pathways. This has given us sort of our first really definitive ideas of the need for signaling. And we talked about back at the beginning of the semester, we talked about how gene expression is regulated. So for example, in prokaryotes, the um, inducers and things like that, and in eukaryotes, transcription factors. So what we want to do now is think about how to link at the cellular level signals that are happening outside the cell, that are coming from outside the cell, to responses that are happening inside the cell. As a precursor for thinking about how do things like jasmonic acid or salicylic acid how do those give the ability of the plant to signal at the whole, whole level, whole plant level? Okay.
So signal transduction pathways. Clearly what we're trying to accomplish is something that is common to all cells. One of the characteristics that we describe to all cells is that they're responsive to their environment. And those responses, well, let's list. What are some cellular responses? to environmental cues in any cell. Be very, let's be very general. What sorts of things might change in response to external cues in any cell? Water potential, eh, water potential might, but that's... They might move. They might move, yes. Plants. Say that again? Plants. Plant cells, no, not so much. <laughs> not so much cells, but I'm trying to be completely oh, okay. general now. So movement, when we talk about movement at the cellular level, what are we talking about? What part of the cell is being affected? Affected? Cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton, right. And possibly like cilia. Yeah. What else? What other general effects? Yeah, so let's be more general. Metabolism. And that means what's being affected is likely to be enzymes. One more. We're missing the big one. I don't know if it's going to guess, but uh, lipoma cell? Like, well, lipoma cell, I mean, you can have apoptosis happen. Oh, uh, yeah, but apoptosis doesn't just happen. What triggers apop or what, what things have to happen for apoptosis to happen? Uh, yeah, so what's got to make that happen? <laughs> Come on, guys. How about gene expression? <laughs> yeah, we really need a break. So if we think about changes in gene expression, what are the things that are immediately going to control gene? Transcription factors, right. So if we think about general signal transduction pathways, somewhere we have a signal, and these are, if it's a signal transduction pathway, the signal is coming from outside the cell. So we start with the signal. And in the end, what is being affected is something associated with the cytoskeleton that's related to movement, something that's associated with enzymes turning on or turning off enzymes that are already there in the cell to alter metabolism, or turning on or turning off transcription factors to regulate gene expression. Okay? So what we want to do in terms of signal transduction pathways is try to understand at the molecular level what's connecting these guys. So certainly one of the things that has to be here is there has to be a receptor. So let's think about what are the kinds of external signals that cells might respond to. And if you give a specific thing, let's try to extrapolate to that to something much more general. So what sort of external signals might a cell respond to? Temperature. Temperature, OK? So temperature, let's, let's be more general about that. Well, OK, let's keep going, and then we'll, we'll generalize this more. Well, what about environmental? That's sort of like saying external. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, but when we, when we, if you want to generalize temperature, maybe we should say physical environment. So the other thing that, what other things might go along with temperature in the physical environment? Light. Light, yeah. So we call these physical. What else? What other non-physical things? Biological. Biological, okay. So what sort of biological things might they respond to? Uh, well, insects, like predation. Um, but 
but insects cells don't respond to insects. Um, it could be mechanical, so maybe we should put mechanical in here with physical. Because there are cells that can respond to, to um, literally to movement. When we have uh, stretch receptors, you know, the, this knee reaction is our cells that respond to movement. Well, in terms of biologically, you have like an increase in water levels. Yeah, we're missing the great big ones. Not hormones. Not hormones. Hormones. So yeah, hormones. How's that external? Say that again. How is that external? Are horm no, hormones are not, ex they're external to the cell. Oh, to the cell. Yeah, oh, sorry, you were thinking external meaning to the yeah. plant? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. External, because remember, we're talking about signal transduction pathways. My definition of signal transduction pathway, the one I would like to at least get you to think about for today, is cellular. Yeah. Right? We'll talk a little bit about, today, about um, whole plant responses. But right now, I want you to think about cellular level things. So hormones, let's just generalize this as chemicals. What else? Anything else? pH. Well, but pH would be protons, right? Yeah. 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 So we, if we were. Talking about animals, could we add anything to this list? Actually, there are some cases in plants we can add to. Neurological. How about electrical? So you can stimulate cells to do things by, by changing their memory potential. Now, and when we talk about neurons and stuff like that, neurons change their memory potential usually by the binding of Neurotransmitters, chemical responses. Yeah. Why are hormones only chemical? Like, won't cells change how they operate if you have, like, you know, increased levels of either ions or water? Sure. Did we, for example, when we talked about nitrogen assimilation, we talked about the fact that nitrate reductase enzyme is activated by nitrate and inhibited by ammonia. So in a sense, you can think of that, that's not really a signal transduction pathway because that's just binding of the substrates to regulatory sites. But expression of nitrate reductase, gene expression, is turned on by nitrate and turned off by ammonia. So there's an example where you have a chemical, not a hormone, but a chemical signal that's altering what cells are doing. Okay, so we've basically got these external signals that somehow has to have to be perceived by a receptor. And we'll talk more about, more detail about the receptors in just a minute. And then we need something else. We need some way of getting information from the receptor to these various things. And the simplest way to think about it is if this is an external signal, particularly if it's a chemical, that can't cross the plasma membrane, that these receptors are often going to be on the plasma membrane. Not always. We'll see a bunch of examples in just a minute. But in the case when they're on the plasma membrane, and if we're talking about changes in gene expression, then there has to be something that connects those. Because you can't get a pr protein that's in the plasma membrane into the nucleus to take care of this. So we need a signal transduction pathway. A signal transduction pathway, I mean, we could say that it includes the receptor, but its key thing is to link the receptor to the cellular level response. And we'll see that these signal transduction pathways, in some cases, can be extremely simple. I mean, we talked about an effective signal transduction pathway when we talked about the role that lactose plays in um, controlling the lac operon. Lactose binding to the inducer protein turns on or turns off the production of the enzymes associated with lactose metabolism. 
right? So there's, a simp there's an example of a really simple signal transduction pathway. Okay. Two other things that this signal transduction pathway permits to happen besides just the connection of the receptor to the response. It allows the signal transduction pathway to be tuned, let's say fine tuning, And that fine-tuning can happen in a couple of different ways. There can be amplification. So in the case of the, the um, production of phytoalexins, the presence of one eliciter molecule can end up with the productions of hundreds of thousands, excuse me, of phytoalexin molecules that would help prevent the bacteria or the fungi from taking over the plant. That represents amplification. It's not a one-for-one one sort of thing, but one thing in, many things out. Right, so that's one possibility. And another possibility we'll see that's important is crosstalk. That perhaps not just a single thing has to happen to turn on a response, but two separate things have to happen simultaneously. We'll see lots and lots of examples of that as we go through talking about plant hormones and growth and development in plants. Because many plant responses to the environment involved antagonistic or synergistic contributions from two different hormones. So in the context of signal transduction pathways, What's happening at the cellular level has to respond in a coordinated way to two hormones, not one. So it requires some crosstalk between the signal transduction pathways. And so the signal transduction pathway permits this sort of crosstalk to happen. And we'll, we'll see how that works in today's lecture. Okay, so we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on at the cellular level. Let's remind ourselves how this now can work at the whole plant level. So for example, you all know or probably at least have heard of Darwin's experiments with light in that dark grown coleoptiles of oat plants will bend towards a light source. What Darwin found was The part of the coleoptile that responds to the light, that senses the light, is at the tip. But the part that responds in terms of differential growth that causes one side to grow faster than the other so it bends is down here. We'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about light receptors in plants in a couple of weeks. But what Darwin immediately recognized from this, and which started the whole idea of intercellular signaling in plants, is there must be some compound that's produced in the light sensing region that is translocated down. So there's an intercellular signal. So let's think about this in the context of two separate cellular signal transduction pathways. So in the light sensor, let's call this cell one. In the light sensor, there's a light receptor. That senses the light. And at the cellular level, in response to the light, it produces a hormone, some sort of chemical signal. And this hormone is translocated through the plant. Inter intercellular movement. And then we have cell two that's going to do the growth response. And this has a hormone receptor and the response of the 
of the cell to that hormone receptor is increased growth. So basically what we have are two cellular level signal transduction pathways which are coupled by a hormone. We could just as easily imagine in, a, in an animal system this sort of coupling with a hormone or it could be coupling with a neuron, right? But in both cases we're talking about two separate signal transduction pathways. What's happening in this cell is very different what's happening in this cell. But those two, those two different signal transduction pathways are coupled to provide a whole plant level response to direction of light in this particular case. Okay? So this is why I like to emphasize the importance of signal transduction pathways at the cellular level. They evolved at the cellular level. Prokaryotes have signal transduction pathways. They're common to all cells because they're common to the earliest ancestors of all cells. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so there are several things in today's chapter that are not that clear. And in particular, the difference between signal transduction pathways between plants and animals. So the absence of G proteins, using tyrosine, threonine rather than tyrosine kinases, um, turning off repressor pathways rather than turning on inducer pathways. You know, can you, can you completely um, attribute that to the mixed heritage of plant cells? In that sense, no, because animals have a similar mixed heritage. So, but you would have to say that the difference in plant cells must have been inherited with the photosynthetic characteristics, right? So in that sense, it would work. It would have been very nice if the book had said that, right? And it would be very nice if the book described in a little bit more detail how turning off repressors rather than turning on enhancers speeds up a pathway. I don't have a clue how to explain that to you. It makes no sense to me at all. But we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, so are we all right with this sort of perspective here? One more thing I want to talk about in general about signal transduction pathways before we go on to give some specific examples. And the book's got a lot of specific examples in it, right? You don't need to know those examples. We're going to go over each of them again when we talk about the various plant hormones and how they work. What you should see are what are the commonalities that are there and how do those commonalities fit into this general picture of signal transduction pathways. Okay, so if we think of a signal transduction pathways, we have a receptor, And then a bunch of steps. We're not going to define what these steps are. There can be lots of different things here. And I want you to think about what's happening at each one of these steps in the simplest sense. The receptor, it either binds or detects its signal or it doesn't. It's either on, if the signal is there, or it's off. Okay? When it's on, what's it going to do? Just in general, what's it going to do? Okay, changes confirmation, but the result of that change in confirmation will be what? It's got to do something to step one, right? In, under normal circumstances, what state is step one in? Off, right? So when the receptor's turned on, it turns on step one. But step one was off before, right? So step one then will turn on step two. But if step one turns on step two and never turns off, the signal transduction pathway stays on. So every single step 
in a signal transduction pathway has to be binary in terms of its characteristics. It has to have an on state and an off state. Because if any one of these steps is on, all the subsequent steps will be on. So it's not just the receptor that gets turned on and off. Every step has to get turned on and off. And students miss that too easily in thinking about signal transduction pathways. Let me give you an example of this. Let's have a signaling protein. We're not going to say what it is, but that signaling protein is going to have two states. And as Anna pointed out, the key thing that differentiates these is some sort of conformational change. The protein chases, changes its structure. One of the most common ways that this can happen to go from the off to on state is by phosphorylation, taking a phosphate from ATP, making ADP, and sticking a phosphate group on this. Okay. That changes, putting that phosphate group on there, it's got lots of negative charges, it changes the local charge distribution, the protein moves in response to that. This protein has a different shape than this one. Same protein, it's just been chemically modified. This reaction does not happen spontaneously. The f adding a phosphate on this phosphorylation reaction is done by a protein kinase. Remember, a kinase is an enzyme that sticks a phosphate from ATP onto something. So there's a hexose kinase that sticks phosphates onto glucose from ATP. Okay. So this is a protein kinase. It turns it on. But there has to be some mechanism to turn this off as well. And that turning it off is accomplished by removing the phosphate. This is dephosphorylation. Or this is phosphorylation. And this is also enzymatic. This is carried out by an enzyme called a phosphatase. Okay, so let's think about how this sort of reaction fits into a signal transduction pathway. This is in the middle of a signal transduction pathway, somewhere down in here. What is it that causes this protein to go from the off state to the on state? The protein kinase, right? It's the addition of the phosphate that's directly doing that, but whether the phosphate is added or not depends upon the activity of the protein kinase. So the protein kinase itself has to be regulated by something else in the signal transduction pathway, right? So in the context of turning this on, it's the activity of the protein kinase that's important. How about turning it off? What's turning this sta state, of, a step of the signal transduction pathway off? The phosphatase. Do we need to regulate both the protein kinase and the phosphatase? Why do you say probably not? I mean, could you imagine a scenario where both of these were regulated? Yeah. You could. But it's simpler to have just one of them regulated. And you're correct. Typically what's regulated is the kinase. And the phosphatase is constitutive. It's on all the time. This isn't always true. But it's true for the vast majority of signal transduction pathways that use this sort of step in it. This is very common in signal transduction pathways. So the kinase is regulated by step, uh, by the previous step. But the phosphatase is constitutive. It's always on. 
So now there's an automatic way to turn off the signal transduction pathway. And the only way it's turned on is by the kinase. And how on the signal transduction pathway is depends upon how long the kinase stays active. And how long the kinase stays active depends upon everything upstream from there. So what you're looking at is the balance between the phosphorylation reaction and the phosphatase reaction. Right? So it means that in general, any single component of a signal transduction pathway is not on for very long. The signal transduction pathways tend to go on, off, on, off, on, off. And it depends upon whether they're on more than they're off, whether you see the signal or not, or whether you see the response or not. Okay? So it's really important to think about signal transduction pathways in this context because we're going to, everything that we know, almost everything that we know about signal transduction pathways comes from analysis of mutants where you give the signal and you see some altered response. And the idea is to then tease apart all the components of the signal transduction pathway and try to understand what those components are based on the characteristics of the mutant. So this tells you right away that for this one protein, right, this protein, it's the same protein that exists in two different states, we could imagine a mutation that would prevent phosphorylation, right? What's, what's going to be the phenotype of that mutant? No response. Never see a response, right? Could you imagine a mutation that causes the conformation of this protein to be in this conformation whether or not there's a phosphate there? What would be the phenotype of that mutant? Always on, right? So mutations, two different mutations in the same protein can give you two different phenotypes. And you know the reason why now. Because every step in the signal transduction pathway has to have two states, an on state and an off state. And if the mutant happens to be stuck or have the characteristics of the off state or the on state, that's going to give the phenotype of the organism in terms of the response. So we'll see mutants that are insensitive to certain types of hormones, ethylene insensitive mutants. Or we'll see mutants that grow as if ethylene was there all the time, even though there's no ethylene there. Right? So it's important to be able to connect what's happening at the molecular level to what's happening at the whole organism level if you want to understand signal transduction pathways. And we have the phosphatase always on? Right. Yeah. The thing is, you have to keep turning on the... Uh, That's right. This step up here, if you have to keep turning it on, right. it requires ATP every time. Yeah. The signal right. transduction pathways, does the information transfer that occurs in signal transduction pathways cost energy to the cell? Yes. Yes. Lots of energy. Lots of energy. Well, okay, so let's, let's, you can answer this question from two perspectives. From the evolutionary perspective, would it be better to regulate the phosphatase? No, because evolution didn't choose to do that. It chose to regulate the kinase, right? So from the metabolic perspective, would that be better? Perhaps, but what that's telling you is your metabolic perspective is missing something important. Because evolution wouldn't have chosen that if overall it wasn't better, right? Can't lose sight of that perspective. Okay. It's too easy to say evolution screwed up, right? <laughs> because we lots, see lots of things just like that that don't make sense. But what you have to do in those circumstances is say, I'm asking the wrong question. I don't have enough information. Because it's unlikely that evolution would have selected for something unless overall it was beneficial for the organism. Also, I have any training I have to get to. Say that again? I have training I have to get to, so I have to leave. Oh, okay. You're forgiven. <sighs> Make sure we don't like, ingest pesticides or something. Okay. So let's just spend a little bit of time thinking about some examples of signal transduction pathways. We've, we've got all the basics down as far as I'm concerned. So if we think about Bacterial signal, tra signal transduction pathways. 
the most common type of bacterial signal transduction pathway involves only two proteins. It's called a two-component system. One of these proteins, the sensor protein, is typically located, almost always located in the plasma membrane. Not surprising because the signals are very often coming from outside the cell. They're always coming from outside the cell, but they can't always get into the cell. So we got to think about this sensor protein basically existing like this. Here's the plasma membrane. Here's the sensor protein. If the signal's coming from outside the cell, then this input domain is the part of the protein that's exposed outside the cell. And the transmitter domain is the part that's exposed on the inside of the cell. This is the same protein. They're just two different parts of the protein. And so it should be clear that interaction of the signal with the input domain causes a conformational change that also changes the properties of the transmitter domain. In other words, the, re the receptor protein, the sensor protein, is essentially a mini signal transduction pathway. It's taking information from outside the cell and that transmitting that to information inside the cell in the form of a conformational change of the protein. For these bacterial two-component systems, the, what happens in the transmitter domain is a process called autophosphorylation. Basically what it does, it hydrolyzes ATP and sticks the phosphate onto itself, not onto some other protein. Okay, so we have when the, when the signal binds, ATP is hydrolyzed and it sticks a phosphate onto the protein. Okay? So signal conformational change that causes autophosphorylation. The, the um, receptor protein or the sensor protein is done. The other protein, not surprisingly, if we're talking about regulation of gene expression, that other protein is a soluble protein in the cytoplasm that has DNA binding characteristics. Right? So this output domain has to have some DNA binding characteristics that when it binds, it either turns on or turns off, somehow modifies the expression of genes. And the con configuration of this output domain is controlled by whether or not the receiver domain has a phosphate on it or not. Phosphate on it, presumably this would bind to the DNA and cause gene expression or prevent it from binding to the DNA and inhibit gene expression. And the whole signal transduction pathway in this two-component pathway is nothing more than the transfer of the phosphate from the transmitter domain to the receiver domain. No ATPase, I mean, no, no um, kinase, you know, no, no ATP involved here. It's just the direct transfer of the phosphate from one to the other. So it's not, this is not the same as this. This is a very simple phosphate transfer. Okay? So very short signal transduction pathway, works just fine, but because there's only two steps in it, there is no possibility of that fine-tuning that I talked about. No possibility of easy interplay with other signal transduction pathways or um, amplification, having one thing causing thousands of thing, uh, products changing. Okay? So one of the things we need to think about is how are these different in eukaryotic systems. So just to show you that evolution sort of works, here is um, part of the cytokinin signal, signal transduction pathway that's present in eukaryotic plant cells. And you'll notice that there are transmitter and receiver domains, and we've got this new thing in here, this H, HPT domain. And let's look at these side by side so we can see what's happened here. You'll notice that the receiver domain of the response protein has been stuck onto the sensor protein up here. So there's sort of been a domain 
copying. And then there's this new domain in here that's basically acting as a intermediate. So this gives you actually a very important picture of how evolution works on proteins, how it works on genes. It typically one of the main ways that new proteins are formed is by switching domains, copying domains or moving domains from one protein to another. So here's an example of where the receiver domain of the response protein in the prokaryote has become part of the sensor protein in the eukaryote. So in the eukaryote, it starts off the same way. Signal comes in, in this case cytokinin binding. The transmitter domain autophosphorylates itself, but that same protein then transfers within the protein the phosphate to a receiver domain. And then that phosphate is transferred onto other proteins. Okay, so it's a modification of this, extra steps. Well, that extra steps provides for the possibility of finer tuning in how this works. Okay, so let's turn to think about signal transduction um, in eukaryotes and particularly in plants. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising from just this simple picture that eukaryotic signal transduction pathways are a lot more complicated than prokaryotic. Most of the prokaryotic signal transduction pathways involve one or two proteins. Eukaryotes, 15 to 20 percent of the typical eukaryotic genome encodes proteins that are involved in signal transduction. That's a lot of proteins. That's thousands of proteins that are involved in signal transduction pathways. The human um, insulin signal transduction pathway in our cells in our body have now, there's been 107 proteins identified that function in that signal transduction pathway. Somewhere at the end there, there's, there's, there's something that affects the uptake of glucose into the cell, but obviously there's got to be a lot of other things going on there. And right away, the thing that you should, should think about is insulin is not the only thing that, con that controls glucose transport in cells. So there's got to be a lot of ro space for crosstalk with other signaling pathways. So that's part of the reason that they're so complicated. We can define... three different types of signals in any, any sort of cell, but we're we'll going to talk about them specifically in plants. We can have um, uh, impermeable impermeable in terms of crossing the plasma membrane. We can have permeable, or often referred to as lipophilic. And we also have some physical signals. Things like light, light, or temperature. So let's ask the question, what does this mean in terms of the lo location of the receptor proteins for these guys? Well, the impermeable signals, you know where the receptor is going to be. It's going to be on the plasma membrane. So for molecules that cannot get through the plasma membrane, the receptors are going to be located on the plasma membrane. For molecules that can get through the plasma membrane, in reality, their receptors could be anywhere in the cell. They can be on the plasma membrane. So cytokinin, for example, is a membrane permeable molecule, but its receptor is on the plasma membrane. Ethylene is a membrane permeable molecule. Its receptor is in the, on the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, auxin. We'll talk about auxin, give an example of auxin in just a minute. It's a membrane permeable, permeable protein. Its receptor is in the nucleus. When we talk about light, light can be just about anywhere, right? Light penetrates the cell. And there are some light receptors. The blue light receptors are in the plasma membrane. And the, um, things like phytochrome, phytochrome is moving back and forth between the, the cytoplasm and the nucleus, okay? So where the receptor is located, depends upon the characteristics of the signal. Okay, one other thing we need to think about, one of the things that, that's shown diagrammatically here, is if we're talking about regulation of gene expression, all of these guys that are external to the nucleus 
somehow have to get information into the nucleus. We need to think about trafficking of stuff across the nuclear membrane. There's nothing about this, well, virtually nothing about this in the chapter, but I at least want you to think about how this happens. Remember that the nuclear envelope has got big pores in it, nuclear pores. Here's a picture of nuclear pore looking at it from the cytoplasmic side. Here's the picture of a nuclear pore looking at it from the inside of the nucleus looking out. And here's a diagram of what we think the nuclear pores actually look like. There's a lot of protein and stuff involved in there. But if we think about trafficking of molecules between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, first of all, how do they get between the cytoplasm and the nucleus? What causes a molecule to move from the cytoplasm to the nucleus or vice versa? Diffusion. That's it. So does, does diffusion have any guidance other than concentration gradient? No. So what that means is if we want molecules to be inside the nucleus, what do we need to do to make them move in? You'd have to raise the concentration of the cytoplasm or lower the concentration of the nucleus. We have to do something to the molecule once it gets inside the nucleus so it behaves as if it's a different molecule, right? So phosphorylation could be one thing that could happen inside the nucleus. The phosphorylated protein is a different protein than the non-phosphorylated protein. So if, the non, if the outside the nucleus they're not phosphorylated and inside they get phosphorylated, there's a diffusion gradient for it to move in. This brings up the whole idea of nuclear localization. The book pretty much treats as if this is as if it's magic. It's not magic. It's simply changes in the characteristics of the signaling, of the, the step in the signal transduction pathway. It may be a protein, it may be a small molecule, but it's changing the relative concentrations of those things in the cytoplasm versus in the nucleus to drive diffusion. Now there are some of these that have the changes also cause them to bind specifically to things. So if you have a protein that's floating around free and it binds specifically to something, then the concentration of the free protein has gone down and you provide a diffusion gradient for it to go in as well. So it's important to think about how binding and conformational changes drive diffusion into or out of the nucleus because it's, we're going to see it's going to be very important. Yeah. Yes, nuclear envelope is two separate membranes. Um, well, let me just draw a picture. It's easier. I don't have a. Say that again? Yeah, so if we look at the nuclear envelope, you know, in cross section, it sort of looks like this. That gives you the wrong picture because really the nuclear envelope is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So this represents not a break, but just a pore. It represents one of these guys that we're seeing in cross-section. So the nuclear envelope is nothing more than an extension of the endoplasmic reticulum. Interesting question to ask from an evolutionary perspective, which came first, the nuclear envelope or the endoplasmic reticulum, right? But they're basically the same thing. So the the two membranes that make up the nuclear envelope are continuous with the membrane that makes up the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? Yeah. Say that again. Well, you have that signal part of the protein that gets sliced off when you get to the compartment where it's supposed to go. If that can happen, yeah. But if that doesn't happen in the nucleus like when you go into the nucleus. So do they just phosphorylize it? So there could be other proteins in the nucleus that might phosphorylate it or dephosphorylate it. If it has a binding site, if it binds specifically, for example, a transcription factor binds to the DNA, then what does that do to the concentration of the free transcription factors in the nucleus? goes down. So now we provided a diffusion gradient for those things to move in. So most important, keep in mind this is all driven by diffusion. If you think about it that way, then you know it must change the concentration gradient. And if it changes the concentration gradient, there's only a few things that can happen. You've got to change the, you either got to remove the molecule, that's not happening, 
you bind it to something, or you change its properties by sticking a phosphate on it or something like that. Okay? Nuclear transport receptors are things that cause them to bind in specific ways, either interact with the, with the nuclear core machinery. So this, to, to say that this is a passive, everything just goes through it, is completely incorrect. So there are things that cause um, proteins to interact in a positive way with the nuclear machinery that helps, helps get them to that pore so they can get into the nucleus. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than I've described. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm going to skip that. Uh, I want to talk about we talk about difference between plants and animals. So the book lists a couple of things: no G proteins in plants. If you look at the previous edition of Taze and Zeiger, it talks all about G proteins, right? So it's only been in the last few years, five years, that we know there's G proteins in animals. There's no G proteins in plants that we know of, or at least as of uh, about a year ago. That may, that may have changed since then, but I don't, I'm not aware of it. Um, well, if you look over the sort of history of signal transduction, most of it was studied earlier in yeast and in plants before it was studied in animals. So yeast and animal systems became models for how plants do it, and G-proteins are common in those guys. So G-protein model was... Um, and there are things that behave like G-proteins in plants, sort of, but they're not really G-proteins. Okay, so this was getting to the question I think that Anna was asking about, about differences in evolutionary origins. I mean, there, there are other important differences. One of the things we talked about here, in bacterial systems, most of the, the amino acids that get phosphorylated in bacteria are histidines. In animals, most of the amino acids that get phosphorylated are tyrosines. And in plants, it's much more common to phosphorylate threonines. Okay? Say that again? Threonine. So they're different, they're different amino acids. I mean, in the initial thing that gets phosphorylated. Yes? I don't know. Anybody know? Oh, that's right, because they hydrolyze GTP. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the thing that the, the book, let me just finish up with this. The thing that the book puts most of its emphasis on, the differences between plants and animals, is that animals regulate gene expression by positive regulation, where animals do it by negative regulation. And a lot of you are confused by that because the end result is turning on gene expression. So how can you have positive regulation in one and negative regulation in the other? So Positive means it has, you know, let me, I had notes here. Positive basically means it turns on some process. And negative means it turns off some process. So what we need to do is put the right words on the end of this to make it make sense. So in the case of turning on, this is turning on transcription. The endpoint of plant signal transduction pathways is turning off repression of transcription. That is, in both cases, before the signal comes, transcription is not happening. In this case, it's, it's not happening because the transcription factor is not turned on. In this case, this happened because the transcription factor is there and ready to go, but something is repressing it. And what's happening in the plants is you're removing that repression. Okay? This is animals. And this is plants. Yes, the end result of both of these is, right, you go one more step and they're the same. Right? This one's turning on transcription. This one's turning on transcription. But they're doing it in different ways. So let's give me two more minutes, and we'll give some examples of this. Okay. Eh, let's, skip. let's go to this one. So it gives, the book gives three different examples. So here's one for, associated with brass and steroids. So in this case, 
This is a regulatory molecule that under normal circumstances, the presence of this phosphorylated molecule inhibits the binding of a transcription factor. The signal transduction pathway turns off the kinase that sticks the phosphate onto this molecule. And when you turn that off, that repression is gone, the, the, um, the transcription factor binds and expression goes on. Okay, so you're removing the activity of this repressor to allow the transcription factors to bind and make signal transduction work. Here's another example. This is associated with phytochrome. Um, here is a protein that when it's localized in the nucleus interacts with transcription factors to block transcription. And what phytochrome does is changes the localization of this protein. So it tells you right away that something more has got to be happening to this protein. It doesn't just magically somehow move to the cytoplasm. Some conformational change or some characteristic has got to change about this protein. It's not phosphorylation. Something else changes about this protein that causes it to move out into the cytoplasm and then allow these light-dependent transcripts to happen. The most common one, and the one we'll come back to discuss briefly um, at the, after the break, is degradation of repressors. So this is an example from the auxin signal transduction pathway where the transcription factors that are needed to activate transcription of the auxin-dependent genes are present in the cell all the time. But what prevents the transcription of the auxin-dependent genes is the presence of this repressor protein, the aux IAA protein. When that protein is present, it binds with these transcription factors, prevents transcription from happening. The end result of the signal transduction pathway for auxin is that that repressor protein is literally broken down. So for those of you who are familiar with it, the main system that's involved in breaking down proteins in eukaryotic cells is the ubiquitin-dependent system. It sticks, ubiquitin is a little protein. It's a protein tag that means destroy this protein. When ubiquitin gets stuck on something, that protein gets broken down. And that's what we'll come back to to finish up this discussion topic um, on Tuesday after break. That's the last thing we need to think about. So remember, lots of examples in the textbook. You do not need to know the details of the examples, but you should see the commonalities between these three examples of negative effects on repression that are present in most plant signal transduction pathways.